Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today on the podcast, we're so happy to have our friend and colleague back, Fanny Brewster. Fanny uh, has written a new book called Race and the Unconscious, an Africanist depth psychology perspective on dreaming. So we talked to Fanny today about this new book. We discussed the importance of community, of um, the ancestors in dreams and dreaming, especially in African cultures. And uh, it was just a great all-around conversation and, and lovely to have Fanny back on the podcast um, for the formal biography. Fanny Brewster is a Jungian analyst and a core faculty member at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Uh, she completed her analytical training at the C.G. Jung Institute of New York and is a New York State licensed psychoanalyst and certified school psychologist. She holds an MFA degree in creative nonfiction from Goucher College. Dr. Brewster is the author of several books, including The Racial Complex, A Jungian Perspective on Culture and Race, Archetypal Grief, Slavery's Legacy of Intergenerational Child Loss, African Americans and Jungian Psychology, Leaving the Shadows, and Race and the Unconscious, an Africanist Depth Psychology Perspective on Dreaming all published by Rutledge. We'll have links to all of them in the show notes. Dr. Brewster is a recipient of the Fay Lectures Honorarium of 2023 from the C.G. Young Society of Houston, and she is also a member of the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts, along with me, Deb, and Joseph. So we were so happy to have her here. Here's our conversation. Well, Fanny, it is um, so nice to have you back with us. I think this is your third time on the show, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Um, always nice to have another Philadelphian here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're across town. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, we and, are. Um, so yeah. this, this tell us about this, this really fascinating new book that uh, I enjoyed so much uh, dipping into. T mm -hmm. Tell us, tell us what, what made you want to write this book or where did this book come from? Tell us that yeah. story. Okay. So uh, the origins of this book is actually uh, my dissertation that I completed ah. at Pacifica. Yeah. Nice. Several years ago. Uh, seems like another lifetime almost. Mm -hmm. um, I started working on that dissertation um, after I had completed my um, the classroom work at Pacifica, and um, and so I had planned at some point, hopefully, to have gotten that dissertation published, and um, and then other books evolved before this one. Clearly, this one was mm -hmm. just published this year in June, and uh, so that's how it that's how it came to be, and um, COVID. Um, became a part of our lives. And so I wound up co-authoring a book with a woman. She's a British Jungian analyst, mm -hmm. Helen Morgan, during the time period when this book would have actually been published two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so in spending time working on racial legacies, which is that book mm -hmm. that I co-authored with Helen, um, this book once again got delayed. But this book has been kind of in the works since I finished um, that work uh, of the oral defense at Pacifica and mm -hmm. getting my doctorate there in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and um, t just tell, tell, tell the, the listeners a little bit about your, your process. Cause you did some independent mm -hmm. research on um, for this book, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, that was really fascinating. I'm yeah. curious about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, in attending Pacifica, 
what I noticed was that there were uh, no books on dreaming that dealt with African Americans mm. or with Africanist people. There were none in the bookstore mm. and there were none in the library. And at the time, Mark Kelly, who is still there, he's the mm-hmm. head uh, research librarian there and head librarian, uh, worked in the bookstore. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I don't understand. We don't have any books on Africanist people. And I'm really interested in that um, in terms of the dream work. In fact, I had come to Pacifica, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically to study dream work. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was. Um, curious and disappointed and wanted to know why. And so he and I had used to have conversations about it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I just, that was almost in the very beginning of my um, work at Pacifica in the three years that I was studying there on campus when I would come to campus. And so at the end of that time period, as I started thinking about what I wanted to do my dissertation on, I decided I'd like to do it on dreaming. And uh, and wanted to do a study, a year long dream study with uh, African American women, and it wasn't completely finalized. You know, first I did the concept paper, and then um, the proposal. By the time I was doing the proposal, I was pretty much into knowing that this was the work that I wanted to do for that dissertation uh, project. And um, a couple of people I wanted to do, you know, to be on my chair were unavailable. And Mm -hmm. I thought, well, okay, that's how it is. I still move forward. You know, there are all these different parts to doing a dissertation and being engaged in that work for literally years. Um, The culmination of all the learning and the experience and really the life of who you are goes into that. Dissertation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's um, how it kind of evolved. And then I, um, once finishing the coursework, I came to, I came back to New York. I'd been living in Berkeley during the time of my work on my initial going to school at dissertation, mm-hmm. that level of the work attending classes. And then I decided to go back to, um, to New York to do the research. So I wound up at CUNY, mm-hmm. uh, City University of New York, their Brooklyn campus, which had, um, and probably still does, maybe even more so now, an extensive library on uh, anthropological studies. Mm. And I was interested in the dreams of African people and those who had heard and recorded those dreams um, in, those, uh, in the 19th century, basically, early mm. 20th century. Wow. And so, yeah. So, so, and this is the thing I think that really excites me about your project is, you know, Jung said that there is this universal substrate that we all have access to. So there's this, I mean, I think kind of this universalist assumption is obviously extremely important in uh, Jungian thought. But he also spoke sometimes in a way that was really kind of awkward and flat footed about the importance of culture and yeah. there is a cultural unconscious and there is mm-hmm. a way that that um that culture stamps us and it, it stamps perhaps the quality of our unconscious so you know there are these kinds mm-hmm. of layers there's the personal yeah. unconscious and then maybe there's this cultural unconscious and then underneath that is the, the universal substrate so you're looking at um you know what can we what can we learn about the the unconscious of a particular of people from a particular <laughs> culture from a particular part of the world? What did you discover? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's 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 an amazing question. Yeah. I love that question. <laughs> you know, I think about Jungian psychology as a psychology of discovery, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's and lovely. As, yeah, as Jungian analysts, you both know that right? That's the work. Um, We don't come in knowing. And Mm -hmm. Jung talked about that a lot, right? It really is the work of the unknown. And sometimes people call us um, cultists, right? Or they have (laughs) in the past, right? Jungian says cultists. Um, And I don't don't mind that, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) Actually. Uh, And so for myself, um, I felt that 
uh, there was so much to discover and to explore in looking at Africanist culture within the context of dream work and within the context of depth psychology. Mm. Jung um, talked about culture. Um, you know, uh, Joseph Henderson out of San Francisco, right, yeah. um, talked about culture, right, in Jungian psychology. And um, Michael Benoit Adams wrote the mm-hmm. book, Multicultural Imagination, this beautiful mm-hmm. book, which I recommend to absolutely everyone who hasn't read it, has a chance to look at it. But looking at African people and Africanist culture has always been a problem for us in America, mm-hmm. even with the field of psychology, especially within the field of psychology in a way. So when Jung looked at culture, he could take some of the goodness, I think, of African culture and look at it. But then when it came time to say, look at the brilliance of this thing or look at how this um, magnifies culture for everyone, he was not able to do that. Don't believe. And I think that came out of his own um, culture, his own cultural experiences, because culture defines us. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just about the food we eat. Uh, I'm just going to reiterate, you know, what Lisa said, because I think it's so important for listeners to get it. And there's a diagram in Jung of, you know, these sort of cones one after another, uh, starting with ego at the top and then uh, family, your nuclear family and extended family and clan and culture and going all the way down to what Jung called the central fire. So somewhere four or five layers down is the cultural substrate that we are all born into. And as you're talking, Fanny, you're referencing the cultural substrate that Jung was born into. And he felt we're all influenced, and we are, of course we are, by by the culture that we're born into, just as we are by our families and whatever religious uh, tradition we may have been imbued with. Uh, but what I'm thinking about for your book is how very complicated this is because uh, Africa is a huge country. Uh, people have a <laughs> <all> continent. <laughs> I, I misspoke there. But, I mean, it's uh, huge numbers of cultures. Yes. And and then there, uh, with the diaspora, people emigrated to South America and the Caribbean and the United States, you know, hundreds of years ago. So what a complicated mix of, of history, trauma, cultural origins, and, and more. You've taken on an incredible complicated, huge task. Yeah, well, I think that um, it, it becomes simplified by, and when we look at the African Holocaust, I think that that has defined in a very large way um, Africanist people who came from Africa and settled in the Caribbean, the ones who wound up even in the UK, the ones who came to North America, um, those ancestors had Mm -hmm. um, unique experiences that were related in kinship. Like you could say someone from Ireland and someone from Mm -hmm. England or someone from Wales, right? Like you have roots that are, Mm -hmm. that are kind of intertwined, right? Interconnected. Exactly. You know, someone Mm -hmm. from Ghana, for example, or Mali or Nigeria, related in those ways, right, in in kinship around African philosophy or beliefs about the earth, beliefs about um, what is important in the family. Those things are culturally there, but interconnected. So I think that, um, you know, when Jung talked about uh, you know, in, in his autobiography, right, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he 
um, references African people. And on that trip to Africa, um, <gasps> you know, he said and did some things. Some of them were um, were fine, and some of them were racially um, racially negative in a way, or brought up images. Mm -hmm. um, that were negative. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I use the thinking about the whip as a symbol. I wrote about that in one of my books, right? And the whip as a symbol of slavery and how it was so powerful in, um, in hurting and harming and killing mm -hmm. black people on plantations often, right? And Jung on his trip, um, use the whip uh, to, in one of the dances that he was doing, he got afraid yeah. as he talked about his hair dream, you know, with his Tennessee barber. He said, you know, he had a dream about his Tennessee barber that um, getting his hair, getting his hair cut and black barber and how it was going to um, make him go black, right? So mm -hmm. Jung's own fears became... Um, evident in his trip to Africa around raciality. And even though these are, and he used the whip to break people up, he said at the end of the dance, because he felt like everyone was dancing and getting so excited and mm -hmm. it was unnerving for him. Mm -hmm. So he took out his whip. And when I first read that, I thought how, how relevant it was as a symbol especially to a black person, maybe sure. for someone reading that in his autobiography as a white person, you wouldn't even think that much about it. But looking at my ancestral heritage, I would certainly mm -hmm. look at that. So looking at things culturally as a black person um, is, is so important. And we mm -hmm. haven't had it enough, right? In Jungian psychology or just psychology, broadly for others in psychoanalysis who do dream work also. Yes, absolutely. It can feel, um, you know, like the purview of uh, Jungian psychology can feel like the purview of, you know, upper middle class white people. And uh, to, to bring in this perspective is so, is so powerful and, um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and enriching too. I just loved reading about um, the, the, the the importance of dream work uh, in African cultures and what they thought about dreaming and the body and the ancestors and <laughs> how dreaming, like in many other cultures that we know of, was connected with healing and uh, it it's just it's just um, it's so so very rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. You know, and I think um, that's. The, one of the main points that we have missed when we look at African and, say, for example, Nigerian or Mali culture, South African culture, you know, we're only just catching up now. And a part of that is since um, the end of the colonization period in Africa, um, and also since more of our own movement in America, um, civil rights movement, Black um, Black Lives Matter even more recently, that we begin to say, oh yeah, black is beautiful, we, we know that. And so let's expand on that and what is the richness of our culture. And we can see more of it now in the films that could be produced, the Black Panther, you mm -hmm. know, more films that look at Africa um, and mm -hmm. Af different African societies, not just for... Um, one particular thing in one particular way, the old films, the Tarzan movies, right? Mm -hmm. For example, <laughs> where black people, black bodies are used to carry, uh, to carry packages on the head on safari or something, you know, it really, um, you know, n needed to develop out of that image. So image is important. We know that as Jungians. And so it was really important, I think for us to, um, move away from that 19th century, those 19th century mythologies um, that were not the narratives of black people, but were the narratives of white people. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of richness there that we still have so much 
to explore. You know, I wish I could, maybe I will re- come back in 300 years, 400 years, and I could say, wow, you know, and to come back and remember, right, in a reincarnated way. <laughs> um, oh, this is where we were at the beginning of the 21st century, and look how much deeper we have gone. Mm-hmm. I, I do believe, um, you know, part of my own uh, care about Jungian psychology is that it does allow for the development of richness, even with Jung um, saying certain things. It's like, actually, what Jung said is the work that I feel is my work and our work in the mm-hmm. 21st century. So don't, say don't more about that. What, what, yeah. say, say more about that. Yeah, yeah I think that, um, you know, people say Jung was a man of his times. And at first, you know, I had my own pushback against that in, a, in an immediate reaction. But mm-hmm. then in these last several years, I've come to think more about it within different contexts. And I realize, yes, he was. And a part of his understanding for the person that he was coming out of Switzerland, this homo genetics in society was right. fine for him. And um, that I have this um, ability to expand and deepen Jung's work because it's what he said was necessary. That, And of course, yeah. he had contradictions in that, right? Like he would say, okay, we need the associations. But then for the dream study that he did in uh, St. Elizabeth Hospital with those men, Mm-hmm. Years later, in the vision, one of his vision seminars in Europe, someone asked him about what were the dream associations for these men, and he said, "Oh, the, it didn't matter, you see." And wow. so, this way in which things could be discounted yeah. um, has opened up for me as a black woman, a black American, Jungian analyst, right? Mm-hmm. Has opened up for me a way to say, well. This is what Jung said. And so if I believe what Jung said about individuation or how we have to deepen, we move the myth forward, we move the dream forward, then that is my work. And Mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. called to do that work. And if Jung was here today, would he not want me to do that work? Yeah, Uh yeah. Man of the 21st century and say, I like what you're doing. Do more of that work. You know, I would like yeah. to think that he would feel like that rather than, right. you know, I'm in opposition. Like, it's not an oppositional thing, right? Yeah. It's definitely not oppositional. Yeah. You know, uh, the, yeah, the, work ahead, of, the work of really uh, looking at and expanding that cultural substrate you know, that we all have grown up in. And as you point out, you know, Jung, Jung grew up in a cultural substrate uh, and at a time when, you know, nobody was calling him or other people to really step out of it. Uh, and he, to his credit, he traveled to Africa, India, uh, visited uh, Native Americans here in the U.S., but he, I think he didn't quite step out of his own cultural framework, but he was curious. And you're, I think, doing the work along with others of really expanding, you know, that our mythological substrate of, wait a minute, there is mythology from all over Africa. There's also mythology from all over Asia. Uh, uh, we don't have to stick to uh, Grimm's fairy tales or Greek mythology only. And h- how can we expand this layer that we share at a yet deeper level as human beings? Mm-hmm. And I'm aware that your work has been very much also with women. Mm. Mm, yeah. Uh, another unsung tends to be unheard uh, segment of humanity. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, you're saying that, you know, reminds me of uh, just a recent conversation that I had over this weekend when I was working. 
And this is about um, our collective, right? Because we talk about how the archetype becomes present in the in the societies, right? Mm-hmm. In the in the collective, and how it gets dressed in the clothing, the cultural clothing of what's going on in the moment. And um, Jung talked a lot about how we as individuals, like it's the individual and it's the collective. That's the relationship, isn't it? It's not, I have, and I got what I needed, and now I'm in this little corner by myself. The Mm -hmm. work is to be able to go back into the collective and to have conversations and to bring something if you find something of value, Mm -hmm. like you have done with your this Jungian life, right? Broadening and deepening consciousness in our lives, in the collective. And... um, so over the weekend, of course, with what's going on in the Middle East, we are all in a way of being constellated, all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's in the conversations with our patients, I'm sure. It is with me. It's mm-hmm. in the talks that we have with groups and with, with um, other individuals. It's, it's stories you read. It's, it's everywhere. And so a part of um, in the last week, what has become has had more energy and charge is the story around the um, the rape and the sexualized horror that happened for women that were Israeli women, and how um, now we have voices. Some of these women spoke out last week and said, mm. "Why have we not heard about um, this more in the news? Why mm. have we not heard about the sexual?" assault that happened with these women. Mm. And so I think that um, it's important that, yes, we do the work of the individual and think about it with the collective, because individuals that come to us to do this work um, in the in the temenos, in that space, um, are experiencing the trauma also of what's going on out there, even though it's not they're not in Gaza in this moment, but we are all feeling the trauma on some level in the way because of how we're connected in consciousness, mm. right? We're all feeling that. So, um, and women, women's voices saying, what about us? What about our story and us being um, hurt and traumatized in this moment? Um, and so, yes. Going back to your question, Deb, about myself and women, I have moved more and more towards working with women's groups, Mm -hmm. calling them sacred circles in my work. Mm -hmm. Um, In the beginning, I was um, I was thinking they would just be sacred circles for men and women, and and it didn't develop in that way. And finally, I understood more and more that the circles were for women, and it echoed my own work with women circles that I had done in the 80s in California Mm -hmm. and um, having, you know, two women facilitators in the way that you two are today, facilitating our our talk together, right? And and realizing that, um, well, for myself, I had an analyst who was very much engaged in feminine, the emergence of the feminine um, Mm -hmm. within your psychology, and um, had written about that. And so mm-hmm. I came through my own training with women. Uh, Claire Douglas was one of my teachers at Pacifica. Oh, wow. You know, yes, looking at women who were on the edge of um, discovery, right? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and being able to not, certainly way past inner discovery, but outer discovery, and being able to say, what is that edge of um the feminine needing to emerge more and differently. And what does that look like? And so they were um, women that preceded me. So I feel in a way that I carry somewhat of a torch in that tradition Mm -hmm. um, for those women. And and it seems um, from your book also very much related uh, to what you talk about in your book as the, the matrilineal African or Africanist Tradition, so the two are are very connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel that, and 
Mm -hmm. Um, You know, this dream book, I dedicated it to my grandmother. Yes, Um, Rebecca. Yeah, to my grandmother. Yeah. That's my middle name, one of my middle names. I have a confirmation middle name also from confirmation (laughs) uh, when I was 12 years old. But um, yes, from my birth middle name, from my two grandmothers, Rebecca is Mm. my middle name. Yeah, so there is this um, consideration and love and um, respect and always um, have trying to have a remembrance of the women that I have come from and my mm-hmm. women ancestors who got me to this space because it's true that, you know, like we don't arrive here by ourselves. No. We do not arrive here by ourselves. No, we do not. Hello, listeners. Here we are headed into holiday season, all kinds of things for lots of people, and the end of the year. And this is a time uh, when we often reflect with gratitude for what we have been given. And so I would like to say thank you for listening to the podcast and especially for supporting us as patrons. Uh, We really appreciate it, and thank you very much for all the ways in which you support us on this Jungian life. Happy holidays to all of you. And I will bring a holiday reminder about Dream School. Um, Now is the time to join Dream School. You can get 10% 10 off if you use the code HOLIDAY2023, and that's HOLIDAY with a capital H. And we have a new uh, um, ability where you can gift Dream School. So uh, just go to the website and uh, thisunionlife.com and uh, you can click on uh, join Dream School. And then if you choose the option for a single payment, there's a little checkbox that says, is this a gift? And I must say that I think a year of Dream School makes a terrific holiday present. So see you there. You know, I, I found all all of the discussion of, about the ancestors in the book really poignant. And just like you're saying, Fanny, we, you know, I think especially as Americans, we don't have much of a sense of the generations that preceded us or where they came from. There's this kind of cutoff for most of us where we don't maybe even know where uh, our family originated from. I mean, there's we all love to do 23 and me and, and but it's a surprise it's like mm-hmm. oh really i'm from that part of the world i didn't even know um so uh, you know there there's a way we're all kind of rootless here mo- most most of us unless we're indigenous to this continent and um i i i loved uh the discussion in the book about the 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 kosa believed that the ancestors speak to us through dreams Mm-hmm. And if the dreams stop, it means the ancestors have are kind of not available. Um, so, you know, we've always in various cultures believed that dreams came as a source of of wisdom and guidance. And some cultures have uh, um, focused on dreams as a way to communicate with God. But what a beautiful thing that dreams are the way ways that the ancestors speak to us each night. And I, I, I don't know if, you know, is that is that something that you found in your in your own life or your own clinical practice? I mean, I can certainly say that yeah. um, I have had people kind of come in and say, yeah, I kind of was guided by the ancestors last night. So I'm just wondering, Fanny, if, what your experience is of that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it reminds me of um, the dream that I had that said that I, that was guiding me to become a Jungian analyst. Ah, When I left Pacifica and did that work, I had no, I had no intention or idea to become a Jungian analyst, right? Mm. I was just trying to go to New York to do that research (laughs) to finish the dissertation. Okay, okay. I was feeling like, oh, okay, Mm. I'm going to go do that. And having the, you know, the anxiety around that, right? And um, Mm. and, and so I, I was in New York about a year after having left Pacifica before I did analysis 
uh, um, to begin with the Jungian. And I had never done work with the Jungian before. Hmm. And so I started my work. And um, I think I was in analysis maybe a couple of years or a year and a half. And I had a dream. And I told the analyst my dream. And I said, you know, I think this dream is about me becoming a Jungian analyst. Oh, my. Um, and she said, well, maybe it is. And I said, I just can't believe that. You know, I was kind of like a naysayer. You know how you get the call? Oh, yeah. Oh, you get the call and then you refuse the call. I, I had that too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah, absolutely. So, so Fanny, are you, are you going to tell us the dream? Well, so you, I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot, but. That attempted to tell you the dream. Um, yeah. So in the dream, there was a man and he was, uh, he looked, um, he was a brown man. Right. And I went to him because I said, I, there's something going on with me and I don't feel well. I said, I don't know what's happening, but I don't feel good. And he said, of course you don't. You have to open your, this, he, in the dream, he pointed to my nose and here. He said, you have to open this more here. And he said a few other words. And he, he said, and then you would feel better. Hmm. And it's what you need to do. And so I, with some a few other associations at the time that I discussed with the analyst, my analyst, it came, I, I understood that it was really the call. It was really the call to do the work and to mm. open from this center, right? Which is, I consider my intuitive center, right? This place where intuition happens. I consider myself to mm -hmm. be intuitive type and um, that I needed, I needed to breathe more deeply and to breathe into that space and to have the healing happen here. Mm -hmm. And um, and that that was going to happen through becoming a Jungian analyst and doing the work. Mm -hmm. And um, so my analyst and I talked about it and I said, you know, I said, okay, I trust my dreams. I believe in my dreams. Um, and yet I, I, I'm not so sure about this thing about <laughs> becoming a Jungian analyst. And um, I said, anyway, it's too late. I said, they've already closed probably the admissions for the year. And she said, well... You never know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I, it's too late. I'm not even going to bother. And she said, well, I think you might want to check it out and see and, and apply anyway. She said, what do you have to lose? The eternal optimist, my analyst, right? Wow, that's and great. Said, I said, sure, I'll check it out. And so I applied and I was accepted. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's great. yeah. So I think that was my, my dream calling me into this work. And like I said, I never left Pacifica, even though I had loved the work that I had done at Pacifica. Mm -hmm. And it encouraged me when I thought about it later on to become a Jungian analyst, because I had loved that work so much at Pacifica, the dream work, the um, work around phenomenology, um, you know, the work around mythology. Uh, mm -hmm. work. I mean, it was just, it was so beautiful to be mm -hmm. in that space doing that work there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that part of me resonated a lot with the idea of becoming a Jungian analyst because I thought, oh, I'm going to do more, much more of that. Yeah. It's be yeah. You know, it's so, interesting because one of the things I highlighted in your book was about um, this, the Sangomas who always were called to their profession by a dream, right? If I understood. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, <laughs> Although apparently, according to your book, um, the the dreams in which a sangoma is called invariably involve a snake. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have a snake in your dream, but um, mm -hmm. but there is that sense of being called in a dream. So. Yeah, yes, it's amazing. I um, <laughs> I have had so many snake dreams and continued snake mm -hmm. as my totem. Mm. Snake. Yeah, like totem. Jung. And yes, and so uh, 
one of the very first dreams that I had when I started Jungian analysis was um, I, I consider myself to have had a series of dreams in the beginning work of my analysis. I look back now and I can say, you know how we look at dreams and we say, oh, that's the initial dream. Mm -hmm. I felt like a series of initial dreams mm -hmm. that had to do with the feminine, that mm -hmm. had to do with the call, and that had to do with defining my, my, um, my creature, my animal spirit in the work. And it wound up being snake. And, um, which of course I didn't like, right? I of course wanted another you animal. You didn't, you didn't want to be a Slytherin? I didn't know. <laughs> I did not want that. Because I, I had a fear of them. You know, growing up in the yeah. South when I was young, you know, there was always like be cautious oh, yeah. yes. about yep. the snakes and oh, what yeah. color they were. The, the and, snakes in the South are not the same thing as the snakes in Philadelphia. Yeah, and and actually there was one out in the yard this summer, um, and it was hot. It was warm, and I went. I went out the back door, and I went. Oh my gosh, there's a snake. It was brown. It was a pretty cocoa colored brown, and it stopped when wow. I came out. It was about uh, about three feet long. You wow. know, headed to the creek, I think, because we have a creek near the house. Mm. And I think it was headed that way. So everything is kind of going downhill towards this creek. And I think it was headed that way. But we have deer. Mm. We have all kinds. Yeah. Of but that was the mm. only time I saw the snake. But we've had some snake skin in the basement of the house. We have found. Oh, oh, oh. And the yeah, but, but babies, oh. babies, right? Babies, they, they got caught on the yeah, on yeah. the is the crickets you see because we also have those oh, so there's yeah, yeah. you know a lot of wildlife near this creek. <laughs> yeah <laughs> even though i'm only like 14 miles from philadelphia in this town yeah, yeah. that's great yeah but you, you know i'm um thinking about the themes you discovered uh with the people whose dreams you recorded and tracked uh -huh. and, and that uh one of the major themes there was family and groups, and then travel motifs. And I wonder if you could uh, talk some about those as as guiding as guiding themes mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for people who are here, women, women of color, that those three things stood out so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a man. Um, Dr. Bynum, Bruce Edward Bynum, he is at um, University of Massachusetts, African American, mm -hmm. uh, who has written several books, and one of them is about black family dreaming oh. and looking at family mm -hmm. dreams and, um, and how we dream together uh, as family. And um, so I... I love his work and have a lot of respect for it. And um, he's a colleague of mine, and um, we're together on the um, International Association, the IASD. Um, for the International the Association for the Study of Dreams. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We are there together um, in what being part a part of that group. And so there's there's quite a bit, I think, that can happen with us in dreaming with family, family dreaming, right? Mm. And being in dreaming about kin. And I think a part of it goes to mm -hmm. um, ancestral dreaming, right? Dreaming about our ancestors. But I think it, it also showed up in the dreams of these women where they all had uh, dreams about their families. And so in the book, I talk about that, right? And they, they, in the interviews with me, because we were together doing interviews and talking about related associations, and one of them, most importantly, was about family mm -hmm. and how they said that um, dreaming about their families was really significant and meant something to them about developing relationships with these family members and how um, they uh, could become more bonded and engaged with their dream life through the dream images of the family 
that showed to them as well as in their wake state. So there was just this um, connection, this interweaving between the wake state and the dream state that could be partly connected by the fabric of family. Mm. It could deepen intimacy and bring them closer together and to help them have a better understanding of who their family really was and what, what was going on with them in the relationship with family. I, and, I, um, yeah. Go I ahead. just, I found that so touching mm. um, because, you know, uh, what I am aware of in Jungian studies and from Jung is how much he emphasizes individuating Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. having to take a stand apart from family mm -hmm. and apart from culture to step outside those uh, areas that we're so immersed in. Mm -hmm. and, and that this presented the other side of yes and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about deepening connection? What about deepening closeness? Mm -hmm. What about deepening understanding of relationship to family? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how you said that, Deb. That's great. Yeah, because I think that that is so important. And, you know, a part of, you know, what Jung said, you know, is that um, African people could not individuate. You know, he did say that. Oh. And, mm. you know, and it, you know, could be surprising to some people that he would say that, but we have to shine the light on some of the things that he said so that we can come to what you just said about how we need to be in relationship and how we need to be with one another and how culture, our culture allows us to be that. <laughs> Find those places where we could have estrangement. So then we could say, oh, this is where I feel disconnected. How do I find the love? How do I mm -hmm. find the connection of being with another, right? Whether it's a blood other or an mm -hmm. other in the world. How do I find that, right? And so I think we need, we need both. We need um, Jung to say, well, there's no individuation possible here. And then we need to come up against that and say, how do I shine the light on this idea that is not correct for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. We bring relationship, love, care, affection, intimacy, mm -hmm. because that's the work that we are aiming at in the Temenos when we do that work. Mm -hmm. and that is the alchemical experience that we are wanting in that work. What you just said, Deb, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's and if we expand it, you know, from the Temenos, the consulting room, the work with an analyst, uh, reapproaching family, friends, community, and and the world at large of how do we also emphasize, grow, and honor connection? Yeah. And doesn't the world need that now? Mm -hmm. yeah. We definitely need that. We definitely need that. Yeah. And, I, and I also want to say that, you know, it, it can be hard for us, right, us in the world, even within our own communities, you mean communities mm -hmm. sometimes, can be very difficult um, to be in a way of connection. And we can have ideas about people. Um, as I could find, I came out of the New York community. That's where I did my mm -hmm. training and, um, and have bonds with some people there that are very loving and caring and wonderful. And there are some bonds that have been, um, you know, damaged and because people are still referencing, you know, from over a decade ago, mm -hmm. looking at, you know, what happened over a decade mm -hmm. ago. And um, we know that the, the New York Institute um, moved in and we formed the JPA another New York-based um, Jungian group. Um, and there's room for all of us, all of us, every single one of us. There's room for every culture. There's mm -hmm. room for everything. Because that was what Jung said. I'm not just saying that. That's part of Jungian philosophy, 
isn't it? It absolutely is. It's, it's a bedrock. It's a central plank. You know, everything belongs. Everything belongs. That's yeah. exact. And everyone belongs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have to figure out how to um, embrace those connections rather than, you know, oftentimes holding projections or, you know, thinking, oh, this is bad. Well, if it is bad, let's <clears throat> shine some light on it. If it mm-hmm. is shadow, like, oh, let's look at it more deeply. How do we mm-hmm. approach it better mm-hmm. rather than cutting it out or refusing mm-hmm. to admit it? Yeah. Right? We have to admit everything. Yeah. Everything yeah. belongs. Everyone belongs. Mm-hmm. You know, I, Fanny, yeah. a, a few minutes ago you joked about it being a cult. And, I mean, I, I can appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. I, rem- I remember one of our <laughs> colleagues when we were in training, she used to joke about how her family was going to have to do an intervention. <laughs> 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 they were so horrified by the things they heard about training that they were, like, going to hire a cult intervention specialist and get her out. Wow. Um, but but yeah. what I actually appreciate about the mm-hmm. Jungian world that I know, and I know not every corner is like this, but that, you know, there really is no dogma. And at least in, in the training that we received, we were really encouraged to figure out what didn't work for us, um, mm-hmm. synthesize other thinkers, you know, know Freud deeply, know beyond deeply, bring that in however we wanted. We were explicitly encouraged to kind of make Jung our own, which I, I think is actually a sign it's not a cult. Um, mm-hmm. but, um, and, and, and I love what you said earlier about how this work is work of discovery and, 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 and its essence is in kind of constantly, um, being open to new things. And Jung has this place in uh, the Zarathustra lectures where he talks about when you find something that's true, you know, taste it, eat it, see how it, you know, is it really right? You know, so it's his kind of phenomenological approach, which just says, you know, kind of does this work? Does it really work? So, so there is this um, kind of built in mechanism for uh, I want to say kind of reform and incorporating new things, you know, and, and like you're saying, it, it's an essential part of it. And so we're called to question what feels true, what doesn't feel true. And, and mm-hmm. I think, again, given permission to say, this doesn't actually hold water, mm-hmm. or at least it doesn't hold water for me, it doesn't hold water anymore. Fanny, mm-hmm. remind me, were you in Vienna in 2019? I don't think you I were, didn't were go. You? Okay. I didn't go. Yes. Because yes. I remember, yeah. and I, I wish I had um, a little tighter grasp on this, but Deb, maybe you'll have a memory too. But there were um, some South Africans there. They, I don't think they were analysts, but they may have been. Um, they may have been psychologists or dream workers with a kind of interest in, in uh, Jungian psychology, and they had come as a group and were presenting. And at some point, they were talking about you know, this really horrendously uh, racist thing that Jung had, I think it was one of his dreams mm-hmm. that had this, uh, this had this image of a, of a, um, an African person in it. And Jung, the way he spoke about it was, was really pretty, um, you know, mm. li- limited and, and distasteful and uncomfortable. And they said, they said, um, yes, this is racist and don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. That, that's that's and it was um and I think it's very much in the spirit of what you're saying. It's yeah, let's yeah. reevaluate this, let's revisit it. Um, there's something here. The core of it is solid, and and it gives us tools to make it better all the time. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And you know, we have also one of the tenets I think of Jungian psychology is that. The remedy is in the poison. Yeah, so that's great. So if the remedy is in the poison, yeah. then yes, of course. Yeah. Then we have to look to Jungian psychology. So, um, for example, when I wrote Archetypal Grief, yeah. Slavery's um, Intergenerational Loss, right, of children, it's writing that book, looking through the lens of grief and looking through archetypal grief. Yes, it's archetypal, the grief that happened for black mm. women going through slavery for generations and child loss that's happened. So it's like, to me, it's using the work that that Jung promoted himself, that he created from his thinking. What do we need here? 
The Racial Complex, that book that I wrote, mm -hmm. development of his work from over 100 years ago called The Color Complex. Mm -hmm. He didn't say very much about it, but right. he said something about it, and he recognized that there were racial differences. And I don't agree with everything he said about what he said about the racial complex at the time, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it gave me an opening to yeah. look at that concept yeah. and to develop something you see. And mm -hmm. so that to me is the work of deconstruction. There's an idea there. There's a principle. How do I look at it? I don't turn away from it. I look right at it and say, what do I see here? What can I see here? What can shift here? It's no longer the 19th century. Mm -hmm. We're in the 21st mm -hmm. century. Yeah. We've got to be looking at things we don't want to see. We don't want to see them. They're painful. They're hard. Some of them are glorious and beautiful. And, and we have to embrace all of it, right? Because it's everything. That's one of our principles as, as Jungian, as Jungian yeah. doing depth psychological work. Uh, what I'm so appreciating in your stance, Fanny, and in the stance you referenced, Lisa, of people from South Africa at the conference in Vienna, is to be able to look at things that are hard, as you have mm -hmm. in the racial complex and archetypal grief in this book. Of It's hard. And uh, we can take a look at what Jung thought and wrote and said, deconstruct it, and, and move things on uh, so that things are better connected. And, and I, I, I really like how you're bringing his concept. I think overall, the concept of individuation is not just individualist. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. It, it should and does connect us more with each other and with other groups that we don't know about, other traditions that we don't know about, uh -huh. uh, other mythologies that we don't know about. So if we can go deeper, we can go broader. Uh -huh. Right. And that's the work. And that's the work. And that's the work. So it, it is really looking at the shadow, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's a large part of our work that we do, and, and we acknowledge that. And then we can fall deeper. And sometimes it is this falling experience, right? Mm -hmm. Falling, falling, and trusting that there is having faith, that there is somewhere to land, that, mm -hmm. of course, it's uncomfortable. Of course, it's hard. That's like... That's life. There is suffering. <laughs> it's yeah. going to happen, right? Yeah. It's definitely going to happen. You know, it is hard and it is uncomfortable, but I, there is also a rightness and a certain kind of joy in it. And I think joy has a ferocity in it. Mm. But when mm. something is right and it moves us and it's challenging and it's hard, but it, it's also nutritious. It's like, whoa, um, yeah. I, 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 it draws us. Yeah. So I, it's, it's not just arduous and, oh, gosh, I have to do this. There, it's very enlivening as well. That's can, right. And, can I, yes, and getting that spontaneity to it yes. is amazing. And I think of it as delicious. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's delicious great. and nutritious. That can, I, can I drop in some quotes? We're talking about individuation. Okay. Jung said, individuation does not shut one out from the world, uh, but gathers the world to oneself. And, um, and the, the other one is, life makes no sense if completely detached. We are only complete in a community or in a relationship. Mm -hmm. There is no possibility of individuation on the top of Mount Everest, where you are sure that <laughs> nobody will ever bother you. Individuation always means relationship. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, it does. I think it does because otherwise, what's the point of it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What's the point of like, and, and individuation continues mm -hmm. through the lifetime. It doesn't yeah. end, right? Mm -hmm. Like healing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like, oh, I'm healed. Really? <laughs> right. 
I, wait, I thought I thought I got individuated when I finished training. Is that yeah. not, that's yeah. not true? That would have been so fabulous. <laughs> Lisa, that would have been great. Yeah. Check, check, check. <laughs> With that. I'm, so I'm done. I'm cooked. <laughs> I'm no, cooked. no, not. That's right. Uh, uh, yeah. Fanny, you grew up in a community. Uh, this is really, um, I don't know, something that is bred in, in your bone mm-hmm. that you've worked with and worked on and written about um, that you know from, oh, you know, day one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about uh, the feeling and the spirit and what, you know, more about community. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I love that question. Um, yeah. I feel like I have um, come of age in different communities. Uh. Um, you know, I really do. I feel that there is my birth community. I was born in my grandmother's house. Mm. She was my midwife. So she brought me into the world. Um, my grandmother Rebecca, my, you know, my, mm-hmm. um, the individual I devoted my book to, my dream book, my father's mother. Um, so I had that community right at the very beginning, coming into that house, and um, you know, my parents lived there in that house with my grandparents at the time. So I feel like I came into this this family that was just there and ready to hold oh. you know, my grandfather, yeah. my grandmother, like we all live there in the same house. Nowadays people are coming back to bring, and they have in-law mm-hmm. units that they could build <laughs> for their families. And, you know, and we all lived in that same house, which didn't have that much space at the time <laughs> looking back, but we all lived there. And um, so that was my first community. And I had a community that, that circle that was the AME church, mm-hmm. which my um, ancestors, my grandparents, my great grandparents had belonged to for generations in that town, right? And um, that was actually the land of previous a barony, right? And from that South Carolina community from slavery and the plantation land. And so I had that community. Um, of the church. And I started um, going to um, school, very young kindergarten in Catholic school. So I had that experience of being in the church, in both churches, right? So I felt like I had a community of, um, of religion and from both places. Plus I had the spirituality that was a part of my own family culture, that I mostly was getting from my grandmother as well as from my father and my mother as well. Mm-hmm. And um, my mother's sibling, her sister was there, my aunt Lena. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up being in her house and being in her home. And so religion, her, the Baptist church was across the road from my aunt's house. She was there on Sundays. And so religion was very much a part of, of the family. So I was held in a spiritual community, a religious community there. And then as I got older and continuing in Catholic school, I feel that the nuns that taught me also were part of my community. Mm -hmm. I had black nuns that came from New York that were my first teachers beginning in kindergarten. The school, of course, was segregated. And so those black nuns in my segregated black school were my first teachers and mothers in a way. Mm -hmm. So I had this community of teacher mothers from the very beginning. So they were also my community. And so I feel like my life has been layered with community through the year. Nested in these different communities. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So as I work in doing more groups now, which, you know, is not typically Jungian, but as I work to do these groups, I'm thinking, of course, this is what I would be drawn to and wanting to do, wanting to have community and to help create community Mm -hmm. with women and help create community with anyone that wanted it, 
because I think it's really important. Community is so important. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, a good so and, and related to it, Fanny, I know um, you just spoke about spirituality and you talked about the importance of the church as, as, a, as one of the communities. And I know that spirituality was one of the things that you explored in your research uh, mm-hmm. in, in, in the book. And, and of course, you know, the book kind of traces the importance of dreaming in traditional African cultures, you know, that, that dreams had a spiritual significance. Can, can you just talk about that aspect a little bit more about dream, dreams and spirituality and, and, you know, if there's, if there's a particular uh, way that manifests either in African cultures or in Africanist people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that oftentimes we think about it coming through the ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And them bringing us uh, ways of knowing. Like the man who showed up in my dream and said, "Um, this is what you need to develop. You need to develop this chakra here, this sense of breathing from the nostrils, make them wider Make them bigger. There's nothing wrong with them that you have broad nostrils. This is a part of your physical, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your your characters, right? Um, So I think that um, that we have um, a learning, a teaching that happens. I certainly have that with my grandmother around spirits and figures who had passed on, and how the spiritual life. is continuous. It's on a continuum. The spiritual life is not, um, okay, I went to church and so I'm done. I went to church today or I got confirmed and I'm finished. Now I'm truly a soldier in the army of Jesus. I'm ready to become a martyr, right? Part of Catholicism, right? Okay, one can hold that. It's an idea. It's part of the teaching um, uh, that others had to pray me out of purgatory, that I could not pray myself out of purgatory, that others had to save me. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the tenets of Catholicism, right, that I was taught, right, that you needed others to pray for you in order to get out of there, right? So then in Africanist um, thinking or religion could be the idea, well, you know, this life is on a continuum, and the, the ancestors that came before can still be with me. It takes generations generation after generation after generation for someone to be lost back in the stars, let me say, back in the, mm. the spiritual space of beingness, capital mm. B, beingness, right? Okay. And then they could be rebirthed. An idea, I wrote about this in one of my books, um, comes that they are waiting in the room to come back. It's reincarnation, principle <laughs> of reincarnation, right? Waiting to be born. And we hear how oh, this person looks just like uncle Mm so-and-so or like Mm -hmm. so-and-so, or look at the features of this person. Like, look at how they are. They're bringing back this person Mm -hmm. that was from two generations ago, right? They're bringing back, revisiting them and bringing back their spirit. So the idea is not that um, that, uh, it ends. The life is Mm -hmm. not ending. The life well, is not ending. Like the dream is not ending. Well, the, right. then that, that's just what we said a minute ago about individuation, right? Is it never really stops? Or even the development of Jungian psychology, it keeps on developing, it keeps on changing. There's more. And I'm so glad, Fanny, that we came back to your dream because I, I was aware that, you know, we, I had asked you about the ancestors and you talked about that dream and then we, we, we got, uh, I think I pulled us off topic, but, but yeah, so the man in your dream was perhaps an ancestor and he was also really inviting you to claim your ancestry. Mm-hmm. I think that that's true. And to claim it through the work. Yeah. Right? And, yep. and the work, I think, Working, um, I guess that word capital W or in quotes has always been important for me, Mm -hmm. you know, an important aspect of my personality and who I am. And, and I, I enjoy working. I enjoy Mm -hmm. that space of wanting to know more and not only wanting to know more, but how is it of benefit for someone else? It's not just that I gain knowledge 
how is it of support and caring for another? Because that's truly being human and relational, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, Fanny, your new book is called Mm -hmm. Race and the Unconscious, Dreaming in Color. And we will have that linked in the show notes. Um, how how else can people find you? Where where should people look for you online? Okay. What, what else would you like us to know? Yeah. So I'm going to give you the updated um, title of my book. Oh, um, actually, okay. yes. And I'm going to show you the cover, which I love. It was designed by a woman, uh, Danielle Hunter. Um, and this couple with a child, they're going through um, what could look like a dream, a field of cotton. And there's mm. an open there where wow. clearly just happening, walking Beautiful. a different path, right? Yeah. So uh, race and the unconscious and Africanist perspective and Africanist depth psychology perspective okay. on dreaming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we changed that title. Okay. Um, yeah, I yeah. Off the, um, yes. yeah, the editor and I at Rutledge changed that. Um, yes. And so um, someone could Google me or they okay. could go to Amazon and look for the book. And we will, we will put links. We will put links in so it's easy to find. And okay. uh, Fanny, we're, we're so grateful for you coming on. We loved being with you as always. Yeah. Um, thank you. And uh, it was, um, and hopefully we'll our hopefully you and I will be able to get together again sometime in person. We did that over the summer, but maybe another yeah. time we'll have to. Yeah, that would be lovely. And we'll yeah. see each other for our next uh, pleasure meeting. That's hopefully right. In January. Yes. yes. So we'll see that's, each other next month. Yeah. We'll that's the Philadelphia yes. Association of Union Analysts, of which we are all members. So, yes. yes. Okay. I want to say thank you both very much, and thank you again for this Jungian life. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it has helped and enriched a lot of people that have contacted me and said, Mm -hmm. I heard about this Jungian life, and I was curious Uh more about Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm. And I think that you have brought so much speak of richness to Mm -hmm. individuals, and I deeply appreciate both of you for Mm -hmm. the work that you do, and and I am looking forward to seeing you both. Great. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank, thank you, me. Fanny, and see you in January. Yeah, thank <laughs> you for bringing me. Thank okay. Yeah. All right. Take, Take care. care. Bye. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. <laughs> this dream is from a woman who's 73. She's a retired scientist and a volunteer teacher. She's entitled her dream, Encounter in the Library. And she says as a preliminary orientation, my dream was set up after reading Jung's autobiography, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. I wanted to know if I was fit for the life of a Jungian analyst. I set up the dream by asking that question. And here's the dream. I found myself in a beautiful old library with a dark, rich oriental carpet, comfortable leather chair, and surrounded floor to ceiling by many books. The lighting was low. To my surprise, I found about a nine-month-old baby girl sitting in the middle of the floor. I immediately had an overwhelming love for that baby. However, there was something wrong with her head. It was not visible, yet I knew there was something wrong. Despite this, I felt so much love for her. It did not matter that there was an invisible problem. The dream ended. I felt at peace. And she adds for context that she's studying Jungian psychology at a university. The main feelings in the dream were love. And then she adds... The baby represented me, and clearly, I had positive feelings toward her. Library. Love libraries. So with all that, let's dive in. Well, I, I, I immediately know what this dream means. Oh, 
Well, then. It means <laughs> that if if you want to become a Jungian analyst, there's something wrong with your head. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Isn't, you know, that's hilarious. And yet, well, it's, there it is. Yeah, it's, well. <laughs> it's hilariously, it's the opposite. That's exactly right, that there's the shadow. Well, I, I was being a little bit funny, you know. It's like I know, got, you need but it's to, also you, there. You need to have your head examined if that's what you want mm-hmm. to do. But, but yeah, there's, there's the shadow. There's, I mean, well, I don't know, Deb. What did, what did, what did you take from the stream? What, what are thoughts do you have? Well, I had a couple thoughts. I thought, um, in a way, what our dreamer has done is she set up a dream incubation. Yes, uh, and. So I'm just going to, we've talked about it before, but I'm going to reiterate that reading Jung's memoir, uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, it is a page-turning must-read about his own internal life. It's so moving and important. Really, all his main ideas are there. I've read it and reread it, I don't know how many times. So she incubated this dream. And then where is she? She's in a library. Well, we go to explanation of what is a library. A library is a source of knowledge, a source of information. Uh, There's information about all kinds of things. It's not overly restricted at all. And it has a kind of old world feel, you know, of classic, wonderful old school library with its oriental carpet and the dim lighting. Um, I associate it to the New York Public Library, which is so evocative of of the spirit uh, that a library can uh, really contain. And then there's this baby in the middle of the room. Something young, something new, nine months old, which is sort of, the baby is nine months old, but nine months is also the period of gestation Mm -hmm. for something to be, to something to be born. And I'm thinking, here's our dreamer who's 73. Can she, can she really be a Jungian analyst? Is this going to be? Uh, the right fit for her. And I think your comment is apropos. <laughs> I offered I, you a jest. It, I know you did, but but I, it is apropos mm-hmm. of if you want to do this, uh, wh- what's wrong here? It's a long, arduous path. And I know, you know, uh, when we were talking with Fanny on the podcast, uh, you know, you joked of somebody where they were going to have somebody come and reprogram her. And many times my family wanted me to drop out. Uh, Mm -hmm. So there is that question of what are you doing? What are you thinking? Well, and and maybe to frame it a little bit differently, you know, the the thing about and and dream incubation, of course, we have a whole episode on dream incubation, but it's essentially where you kind of ask the unconscious to weigh in on something. But I I think that um, uh, in some ways, the unconscious is usually not as interested in the exact (laughs) form that something takes in our outer life. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm mostly where you are, Deb, but maybe just a little different emphasis. This library is beautiful. And it does evoke a kind yes. of typical, um, you know, analyst's office. I've got my, I don't know that you can see it, but I've got my my oriental, maybe I'll just show everyone the oriental <laughs> rug. Oriental my, rug. My books That's... <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so yeah, it's kind of, it sort of looks like the typical analyst's office in a way with all the books. And it feels good. And then there's this baby. So it's mm-hmm. a space, her, let's put it this way, her interest in Jungian thought is a space in which something new and tender can emerge that she can connect with in love. So a new aspect of herself can emerge. But I don't, I don't 
So the unconscious is clearly sort of giving a thumbs up on her interest in this topic um, or the space that it's creating in her life. But I don't know that the unconscious is particularly weighing in on uh, kind of under um, undertaking a specific course relative to it. Um, there is an indication that this baby needs some attention. Um, <laughs> that, that So it's almost like, well, actually what you need to do here is turn toward yourself and and attend to that and and that may or may not involve jungian training in a way but um but i take your point Deb, yeah. that it, it is difficult it's expensive um we certainly had colleagues who began the training process very very late in life and i i think some people do feel called to undergo it um and and you know there's a real question about the kind of cost benefit analysis. Um, not that not that that is a very Jungian way of thinking about it, but there it is. But but there are other ways to develop soul and individuate other than pursuing analytic training. Yes, I I think your point is right on. I, I think and and the dream is not going to be. The definitive answer about for for anyone really about here's your specific career path, but really about what right. is going on in you, what is the state yes. of psyche around this, and the dream maker puts her in this you know wonderful evocative uh glorious image of a library where you can learn all kinds of things, and a baby, for which she feels great love, and a baby that is going to need attention. So she's in the right place. She has the right, right attitude, a loving, accepting attitude, a curious attitude, uh, but she's moving toward the baby. Mm -hmm. And that that something can grow, you know, and whether it is as specific uh, as Jungian training or not is unknown. Right. But but something about her own personal process, Jungian ideas, Pursuing something this young, wisdom, you know. right, and something young in her that she embraces. And wants to grow. That's mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. You know. So what I would tell this dreamer, I think, you know, if if the dreamer wanted my opinion, is well, you don't know yet exactly, but uh, the the dream is certainly, as I said before, I think saying like, yeah, this is the right place to encounter this part of yourself, and I believe she called it the encounter in the library, and mm -hmm. that is the work right now is to encounter yourself. And and then perhaps to see, you know, what, what comes yes. from that. And, and the very young part of yourself, mm -hmm. uh, something that is young, right. that is growing, that is there in the library as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, with, without being too attached, it's ho always hard for us, I think, uh, without being too attached to outcome mm -hmm. that, that has to culminate in this, there there are, you know, all roads lead to Rome, one way or another. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.